So hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, which is making effective and compliant advertising claims in the UAE. So there will be an opportunity for a Q&A towards the end of the webinar. So if you've got any questions as we go through, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box and I'll answer those towards the end. It's also being recorded, um, so I will send out the recording at the end of the webinar as well. So I've been talking a lot um, over a, a series of webinars, um, if you've attended any of the other ones, about the importance of testing um, and making claims in the countries that you're selling your product and how important it is to be aware of any advertising standards and, and any kind of testing sort of requirements in the countries that you're looking to sell them as well. So obviously today we're looking at the UAE in particular, um, so to just get the agenda up. I'll be looking at the advertising standards and organisations which regulate them within the EUAE. I'll be looking at the legislation surrounding the advertising claims, some challenges of advertising and exporting that's specific to the UAE, how we substantiate those claims, um, again relevant to the UAE, and I'll share a case study to really demonstrate that, and then also look at some of the penalties for illegal and withdrawn ads as well, um, just so you can see kind of what the implications are if you don't have these sort of things in mind that we go through. So why are we talking about, oh sorry, introduce myself first. <laughs> um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm the Regulatory Director at Aiton Global Research. I've been at AGR for about eight years now. Um, so I started off as a study manager, went through to the training director role, and now I'm in regulation. The reason for that being is because uh, through everything that I ever learnt um, doing a consumer research specialist job was that regulation is really, really important. Um, and although through my training, I really thought about training our clients about regulation, there was no specific job role for it within our kind of company. And it's actually a huge part of consumer testing. Um, we get a lot of questions from our, from our clients about things like advertising regulation, where they can use those claims, where they should test dependent on those claims, and how to make the most out of those advertising claims as well. So that's something I really put myself forward for and, and, and as part of the role. Um, and because of that as well, I've been traveling, um, apart from this year, of course, uh, to give lectures on this topic um, and certainly do these webinars as such as the one today. Um, because it, it's something that people, as I said, aren't necessarily talking about is, you know, about advertising standards and how that relates to the testing that you need to do to validate them. So specifically to today, the reason I talked about the UAE and the reason I want to talk about it specifically is that it is a huge market, um, particularly with cosmetics. So again, this webinar can be for anyone from any sort of FMCG industry. Testing and advertising standards are going to be the same. But obviously, I know a lot of you will be from the cosmetics industry because that's where we see a lot of advertising claims. So it's where we tend to test a lot of products in, in the cosmetics industry. Um, and it's where a lot of our clients are based because uh, people don't need to put the same kind of claims on other kinds of products they do on cosmetics where it's quite a contested market and people really um, want to know what they can get from using a kind of skincare product or a colour cosmetic. It's really important to have something on there. Um, to make it stand out from your competition as well. So the, yeah, the cosmetics market in the UAE is massive. Um, the main kind of market that we're looking at there is premium cosmetics. So we see a lot of premium cosmetic brands looking to launch in the UAE. Um, as we know, there's kind of a mall, there's quite a lot of malls over there. I don't know if you've been out there. Um, but yeah, you have sort of lots of cosmetic shops all in one place. And it tends to be quite prestige brands, um, depending on where you go. There is an increase in demand, um, so the youth population uh, does seem to be making a growing demand from the cosmetics. Working women has been an increase as well. And there's an adoption of the Western cultures that seems to go over to the UAE. We see that with a lot of brands that are really popular over there in cosmetics. Um, a lot of the brands that are, you know, generally Western and, you know, big uh, kind of uh, outlets like Sephora are really popular in the UAE with all of those kind of Western brands in there. So it's certainly something if you're from, you know, if, whether you're based in the UAE or whether you're from a more Western country, it's certainly a really good place to start looking at selling your products if you're not already. The impact of COVID-19 on the UAE. It's really important at the moment, I, I always kind of bring this up in webinars, not to ignore what's happening in the world. There is a global pandemic and unfortunately it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Um, so it's really important for us to think about in our business as well. So there has been a fall in um, cosmetics purchase in the UAE because of COVID-19. Um, this is really um, 
common for most countries. There isn't as much international travel. Travel retail is really popular in the UAE as well. Um, and that's something obviously that people are kind of investing in a lot at the moment. So people aren't really going over there. Um, you know, same with any country. But people are looking to uh, buy online and that's that's the kind of uh, overall trend here as well. And that's another thing that I like to talk about, because if you're selling online and you're looking at the UAE, it's time to really think about your claims if you haven't already specifically for the UAE market. The skincare category, um, and this is quite similar across the globe, it seems to be for cosmetics. The, um, the kind of category that will continue to grow and do really well because people aren't so interested in color cosmetics necessarily if they're not going out as much. But people really want to spend that time on themselves, have a bit of self-love and skincare is certainly uh, something that's boosted really well. I'm sure everyone has uh, done the same thing where you've kind of given a bit of a chance to pamper. I certainly did it at the beginning of lockdown that all those face masks I've had tucked away had the chance to use them again. Um, and this is, you know, this is definitely something that we need to start considering. So again, it's just kind of a thought in mind if you're looking at claims and thinking about the UAE in particular, maybe it's to look at those kind of more self-love skin care claims rather than anything to do with color cosmetics um, and kind of you know looking better for other people it's about looking better for yourself I guess so to go down straight to the regulation uh, because we've looked at the UAE market it's really important before we even think about advertising somewhere you know what are the advertising standards what are the organizations and what is the legislation so the UAE works very similarly to a lot of other countries where they have a self-regulatory organization and that is the advertising business group so what do they do what what is a self-regulatory organization so they regulate the adverts in their own country, that's quite obvious. Um, but it's a way of the industry to regulate itself, so we don't have to bring it into a federal kind of uh, point. Um, people should be looking at the code of conduct of that self-regulatory organization, making sure that adverts are compliant, um, and this way we don't have to kind of have someone look at everyone's claims, it should be something that you're kind of handling yourself. However, there's a complaints basis. So um, as it says here, they provide a platform for handling issues. So whether you're a consumer or you're a competitor of someone, if you see someone's product on the market and you don't believe that they are following the ABG's code of conduct, it's usually um, to think if their claims haven't been substantiated, um, you can complain to the ABG and then investigate it for you and possibly ask uh, the, the person whose product's being complained about to take their adverts down or amend their adverts or whatever needs to be done. So it, it works very similarly to a lot of other countries if you're familiar with other advertising standards um, across the globe. Um, it, the, their kind of points um, that they kind of cover is to establish and advocate good advertising, so honest advertising, not misleading. Drive awareness of the ICC code. So again, this might be something you've heard me talk about before. The International Chamber of Commerce have a, a self-regulatory framework that countries adopt. And the ABG is one of those countries that's adopted it. I think it's about 52 countries now. Um, so really, um, they'll be quite similar to any other country that have adopted that code and generally probably have the same kind of code of conduct. So again, it's great if you are looking at, a, if you're a global brand, and you already sell in certain countries, you're looking at the UAE, you may find that the code is very similar to other countries that you're advertising in currently. Um, so they also provide advice. Uh, so again, if you're looking at advertising in the UAE, go on their website, they do have information on there. Um, and so do the National Media Council, which I'll talk about next. So yeah, exactly that. They provide a forum for escalation of advertising disputes. Um, so that's what they're there for. It's very much this complaints basis and they've got all of that information you need to know just to make sure that your um, adverts are following their code of conduct and hopefully won't be complained about if you launch there. So the next company is the National Media Council. Now they are the federal government body. Not every country has this, so it's a bit different if you haven't um, advertised there before or if you haven't done it before. The ABG are the self-regulatory organization, the National Media Council with the federal government body, and they work alongside the ABG. Um, so it's really important to be aware of it because when you're looking at federal points, there are obviously much harsher penalties um, rather than kind of being told to take your advert down. So be very, very cautious um, before you start advertising in the UAE because there are quite severe penalties compared to a lot of the globe. So they are basically developing the advertising legislation themselves, so the NMC 
you know, we'll, we'll work with the ABG, um, make sure that they're making, putting laws in place and regulations in place. So again, always look at their website. They have news released on there about any new legislation to do with advertising. They also have the advertising guide on there, which I think is really, really helpful. It's not a huge document. It's reasonably straightforward, but it just gives a really clear breakdown um, of kind of things to consider before you advertise in uh, the UAE kind of breaks down, as it says, the general principles and frameworks and standards. Um, and, and yeah, kind of just gives you a bit of information there. So it's really important to know that they're the ones that enforce the um, kind of penalties for advertising. So if a consumer was to complain about an advert and the ABG get that complaint, they may um, escalate it to the NMC if they feel that you are deserving of a fine for the advert. So that's quite common. I'll talk about that a little bit later as well, about some examples of fines that you can receive for mistakes leading adverts in the UAE. Um, just to kind of note here again, I want to bring it back to um, COVID-19. I think it's something really important that we all need to be considering with our advertising. And this has come from ICAS, who the ABG are a part of, so the International Council of Ad Self-Regulation, as well as some other organisations there, including the European Advertising Standards Alliance, the FDA and the FTC in the USA, and Conor Red, which are the advertising group in uh, South America. They've all kind of put out some uh, real um, warnings, basically, about people misleading adverts during COVID-19. I think it's something I'm not seeing as much of now, but certainly towards the beginning of the pandemic, you were seeing things like uh, face masks being advertised, saying uh, this will protect you against COVID-19. Well, obviously, face masks help, but you can't say it's going to completely protect someone. That's not true. There's not enough research. Same with hand sanitizers. You know, this will you know completely reduce your chance of getting COVID-19. This isn't entirely true, but you can say it kills bacteria because that can be substantiated, it is true. And even as far as some supplement brands were caught in the USA saying um, this will cure COVID-19, which we know there's no cure, so we absolutely can't say stuff like that. The problem is here is you're exploiting people's fear to make sure that you can sell products, which is just a big no-no when it comes to advertising. People should be able to make an informed decision knowing what the product actually does and purchase it for those reasons rather than um, kind of anything that you're driving them. So just something to be really cautious of because don't, I'm not saying not to advertise and sell products, particularly like for the pandemic. I know a lot of companies that I work with that had, um, you know, cosmetic sales really drop. So start making hand sanitizer, which is fine. People actually need it as well. People, there's a demand for it from consumers and it is helpful as we all know, going into a shop, putting some hand sanitizer on does help remove germs and, you know, re reduce the risk, but we can't say it removes it completely. So in terms of, that's all the advertising kind of standards in the UAE. Um, and again, I'm kind of, as I said, I'm really going to focus a little bit on um, cosmetics here. But as you can see, this covers a lot of other industries as well. So ESMA and ECAS, who are these people and why are they important in the UAE? So all cosmetics and these other industry sectors, as you can see from electrical to food, um, have to go under a mandatory regulatory control called the Emirates Conformity Assessment System or ECAS. And that is regulated by the Emirates Authority for Standardization and Metro Metrology, um, ESMA. So it's a bit like uh, the EU cosmetic regulations where you might have, uh, you might have to register your product um, before you can sell it. It's a very similar thing. You basically get a stamp of proof. Uh, so if you've got a cosmetic product, you'll go through this application um, and it will say that you've got a stamp of proof and it, it's regulated. This is a bit like, a, where I said it's a bit like the EU, um, you know what we have a responsible person in the EU, that responsible person will review your claims and make sure they're happy with them, that they've got the right evidence behind them before you advertise over here. It's very much the same in the UAE. Um, you have a, um, it's not necessarily a responsible person, but there are third party people who help you through the ECAS application and they will review all of your claims and everything like that and make sure that it's all substantiated. Um, and everything like safety testing as well. It's not just claims I'm talking about. It really is everything about the product. Um, to give you that stamp of proof to make sure you can start selling products there. So it's just a really important thing to be aware of. Again, if you haven't started launching in the UAE, you will need to go through um, the ECAS Certificate of Proof. So 
We've talked about claim substantiation a little bit, um, and I just want to kind of look at those methods now, as I mentioned earlier, of how we can be substantiating our claims to make sure that we have that evidence. So if you know we ever get kind of in trouble in the UAE with the advertising standards, we have that evidence behind our claims so we can say absolutely yes, it is true. So how do we get that evidence? I'm going to talk particularly about consumer research today because that is what we do at Aiton Global Research. So what is consumer research? Um, so basically, it's to do with consumer perception. When everyone and when anyone ever asks me about the difference between clinical and consumer testing, um, consumer claims are all about what the product the consumers can perceive themselves, what they can self-assess. So it might be something like my skin feels really soft and moisturized and silky and smooth, um, whereas a clinical test might be moisturized for 24 hours. It's a very different kind of claim. One is someone saying, yeah, I really feel like I've already moisturized and the clinical testing is very much kind of an objective fact, basically. There's place for both. Um, obviously we specialize in consumer. The best thing about a consumer test is um, you can get lots of claims at once. So you can sort of say all of the claims that you need to do, you can ask it in a questionnaire, get them substantiated. And then we tend to work with clinical partners to go, okay, well, we've got all of those claims, but you really want 24 hour moisturization. So one of our partners is going to do that test while we do all of the other claims as well. It's really important as well, though, for reflecting the actual product test, uh, the actual product you, in use. Um, so what I mean is when you're sending a product to, to consumers, we tend to send it to them at home with all of your usage instructions that you're expecting to have on your product packaging. Um, and then they'll use it in that way and then have an assessment for it that way. Again, with clinical testing, they are going to a lab, someone will apply it, and th there's definitely room for it. It's really important to have the scientific evidence, but you're not really getting a reflection of the consumer. So often our clients will have clinical evidence and then do a consumer test as well to actually prove it's going to work like that. Why is this really important? Not just for your kind of product feedback and your development. This can be really important in advertising standards as well. Where I mentioned before, people will complain about a product to advertising standards. If you kind of say to your evidence, okay, well, we had 10 people go to this lab and have it applied, um, there's every chance the consumers would say, well, that's not how I felt about it because you need to ask 100 people when they actually use it if they feel like that as well. It gives you a really good body of evidence behind these claims. And this is the case globally. This isn't just for the UAE. Um, this is really good for undesirable event reporting as well. So talking kind of less on a claims level, but more on a product development level. You get your um, kind of, you might have a patch test or something like that for your undesirable events um, and know that you haven't had any undesirable events reported. And then, as I said, when you send it out to 100 people, you might find more people are actually reporting that they have some kind of undesirable event. And you can either use that and put sort of warnings on your labels or just note for your product development um, or change your formula. It gives you a really good chance. At the end of the day, you're researching the product. It really helps you know where to direct, not just how you're developing your product, but your marketing and everything like that as well. As I said, some, for some claims, you may need additional evidence and we can really help with that. Um, one of my specialists is to have a gap analysis, know what claims you're going to make on your product and I can advise what tests we do and what tests a partner might need to do, um, dependent on what you need, basically. So why else conducts consumer research? I've talked about the claims. Um, obviously, this is really important for today, um, but it's, it's really good to look at the other parts of it as well, because again, that's something that a lot of our clients um, like to do, not just look at their claim validation, but get all of the feedback that they can and all the marketing, marketing material they can to be able to really drive that when they sell their product. Um, so obviously, claim substantiation really helps with product and brand perceptions. If you haven't launched into the UAE yet, but you want to, um, you're not sure how your product is going to be received by them, you can send your products there. And as well as asking the consumers about the efficacy of the product, those, those claims, the claims you want to validate, you could then ask questions at the end about your packaging design, about the price point, and really understand if the consumers that rated your product would actually purchase it given the chance um, and that would be really investigating that market before you have to launch your product there and kind of take a risk so it's a really great way of um yeah just reducing risk basically 
Benchmark testing is great as well. You can either benchmark against a competitor or many competitors or test a reformulation. I'm doing a webinar next week with my colleague Thomas and we will be talking specifically about comparison testing, different ways to compare um, products, you know, for all different reasons. So if that's something that really interests you, I would really recommend coming to the webinar next week um, and I'll send out invites to that soon. Um, because that will really cover sort of those kinds of uh, legislation about comparison testing as well as the other reasons you might want to do a comparison. But often it really is a useful thing um, for kind of if you've got different viable options that you, you're not sure which one you want to develop or you have a new, new formulation and you supply it a new ingredient. Um, comparison testing is a fantastic way of understanding that. Um, you can also gain sort of marketing material, things like testimonials and reviews, before and after photos, video reviews. These are something that we do really, really commonly. Um, it's something that's fantastic for marketing. I know people that have done video reviews and then put them all together for an Instagram advert, people reviewing their product. They don't have to think of it just as validating claims. Think of it as a huge marketing opportunity when you're doing consumer research. So that's consumer research. <laughs> um, and as I said, it helps you validate claims, but I think it really, really helps to see examples of how it's been used. Um, and that's what I'm gonna show you. Um, so another thing I get asked quite a lot is, okay, I've done my consumer research study. Where can I use those claims? Well, it doesn't matter if it's clinical or consumer research, as long as they're worded correctly and the evidence is appropriate, you use those claims wherever you want to, on your pack copy, online, social media, web, uh, websites, mar magazines, anywhere. You can use that. That's your claims validated. Use your claims. And I, I encourage you to put the claims, once you know they're validated and you have that evidence and you know it's appropriate for the country you're looking at, put the claims wherever you can, um, really market your product. Um, because the saddest thing for me is when I see clients get fantastic claims about their product and they don't push them. They're not putting them on their Instagram. They're not putting them on their website. They're just kind of putting them in and making sure their claims are validated. Um, this is basically some really good examples of people really using their consumer research claims. So these are, I've picked some best-selling products in the UAE as well. So you get to really see how um, this evidence has been used uh, kind of specifically. So we've got Charlotte Tilbury, Huda Beauty and Estee Lauder. And as you can see, we've got some really great, um, great claims here. Charlotte Tilbury, as you can see as well, um, this is how you word consumer claims. So, you know, there's, so there's a difference with clinical and consumer testing, and it can often be about how you word those claims um, in particular. So percentage degree claims are a great way to show your consumer claims. Um, and we, if you look at the wording in particular, you've got things like skin felt intensely moisturized, skin looked and felt smoother, skin felt instantly refreshed, 96% noticed an overall overnight facial finish. Now, these are all things that, as I was saying, are perception. We're not saying the skin is moisturized at um, such and such percentage because we can't say that with our consumers, but we can say that they felt, they noticed, they looked. These are all things that a consumer can assess. And actually, from a consumer's point of view, I don't think people will necessarily kind of... Um, sort of not sort of notice um, that there's a huge difference be between it being scientific or consumer. These are the kinds of wordings that really resonate with consumers. Notice an overnight facial finish. That's not scientific, but you would see that and think, well, I really want an overnight facial finish on my face. Um, so this is where I would always say consumer testing is a fantastic way of getting really um, relatable claims to your consumer. Whereas 30% increase in moisturization I don't really know what that means on my skin. Does it feel moisturized? Great, that's what I want. Um, so this is, you know, it's obviously really subjective. Everybody's different, every consumer is different. But in my opinion, I think more relatable claims is what's going to sell your product. Um, so again, it's the same with Huda Beauty. Um, you can see that they've said about the amount of time that was um, tested. These are clips from the website, so I might not have it for every single one. And again, with these Estee Lauder, um, you can say a significant reduction of the look of. Now, this is where I was saying you might have percentage claims, but you can also just list them. So what they would have done is got a pass mark on their claims for dark spots, sunspots, age spots, and acne mark. And they can say this is a significant reduction because enough people have agreed with that. Um, and then they've also got the percentage claims there as well. So you can do a bit of both. You haven't got to just do percentage.
So uh, social media as well. I've got these clips from Instagram and Facebook. So Origins, um, as you can see, they've got 97% of uh, felt so smoother, softer skin. And they've got the little uh, small text there to say sensory testing on 107 women. So you can get an idea of um, who's it actually been tested on. And then off the Elemis as well, they've put 91% agreed this frothy, soothing cleanser left their skin feeling gently cleansed, purified and refreshed. Um, so uh, exactly that again, really great ways of showing off those claims in a way that's very relatable to the consumer. Another little note here, um, so a bit more formal rather than an example in particular, um, it's basically from ICAS, who, as I mentioned earlier, the UAE are a part of, the International Council of Advertising and Self-Regulation, um, basically to say that there was always this kind of separation from claims on packaging to claims on things like website and social media and things like that. And um, website and social media is always what people really looked at, what the SROs really kept an eye at. But actually, um, the, the, the claims on the packaging are just as important because if you're a consumer and you're purchasing the product in a shop, you would look at the bottle maybe of two different serums and think actually this one like oh, this has all these benefits on it they sound amazing now what if it's unsubstantiated that's so unfair to the other bottle they've looked at that maybe you didn't have the same amount of claims so it doesn't matter where your claims are being shown whether it's online or it's on your packaging they still need to be substantiated so <laughs> there's all your examples of where you can kind of show your claims. So now I just want to share a case study of how we actually substantiate that through consumer research in particular. So this is a, a particular brand that we tested for. And they're a global award-winning beauty brand that are available in 76 countries, including the UAE. They wanted to test a clay mask, um, obviously to make sure that they were substantiating their claims relevant to the advertising standards in the UAE, but also they need to make sure they test in the UAE in particular um, to substantiate these claims because of the ambient temperature and skin type. Now, this is a really important thing that um, I need to kind of talk about because um, I often get asked, you know, where do I need to test my product? Does it really matter? Yes, it really matters. Because if you're testing, a, uh, if, you, if you're selling currently in the UK and you want to launch a product in the UAE and you have claims that are substantiated in the UK, is the climate over there and the skin types that are predominant the same to the UK? Not really. Would the product perform in the same way? Probably not. So it's really important to have evidence that is supported in the that is, in evidence that is applicable to the countries that you're selling your product. It doesn't mean you have to sell in every single country that you're testing. Um, as I said, this is this brand is in 76 countries. Not every consumer test do we say you need to test it in 76 countries. That would be crazy expensive, and you'd have so many products out there. But you do need to reflect at least um, an, a representation of the countries that you're going to sell that product. And certainly if the UAE is a huge market, it's really important to consider that climate and skin type. It's also really important to think about it as acceptability. So I was talking to a, a few clients this week that all actually had um, really similar requests. Um, and they were saying, you know, for the UK and USA and, and Germany, do I need to test every product there? Well, the climate and the skin type is very similar, um, but do you want to get some feedback on how their product is actually going to be accepted by your consumers? So that's really important as well. But our volunteers in Germany may not have the same opinion in the USA. The other thing is it's up to the advertising standards. It's at their discretion. If you had um, claim substantiation for somewhere like Germany and you were, test, you were selling the product in the USA and someone complained about it, they could turn around and say, actually, no, we don't accept this evidence because it's not in the USA. It's really at their discretion and it's hard to kind of give a simple rule there. But certainly for yeah, any kind of Western kind of country compared to the UAE, the skin types and the climate is going to be different. So make sure your evidence, um, if you don't have it already, is reflective of that country. Um, you, you, can have, uh, you can have evidence from the UK and the UAE, and if your um, claims are accepted and they're valid, you can combine those results together as well, as long as it's accepted in both countries. So you, that's something really similar for us. You might have 100 respondents in each country, and then when you put your advertising out there, you say out of 200 women, which sounds fantastic in your advertising as well. So that was kind of my little, my little uh, bit of advice about what countries to test in. 
So for this particular product, we're looking at testing in the UAE because we need to make sure we've got the right and think temperature and skin type. They wanted to substantiate the claims that the skin is softer and smoother and that the infections are improved. So these are things that we had to really look out for with this test. The specific legislation, so I talked about the ABG having a code of conduct. What do they say specifically about substantiating advertising claims? They say that all advertising claims and representations must be able to be supported by competent, independent and reliable evidence. Really important keyword there is independent. So this is quite similar with a lot of countries. Um, you cannot use your own internal testing. Um, so I know in the USA in particular, a lot of companies have their own testing houses. That's fine. It's allowed over there um, for some claims. But certainly in the UAE, those claims wouldn't be accepted because it has to be independent evidence. Um, reliable evidence, of course, as well. Um, this is where we can really help with things like, as I mentioned, the amount of volunteers in the study. Um, that's what we're trained in to make sure your study design is reliable uh, with your evidence. So just really important to kind of have that really specific part of legislation to know that it is completely important to get your claims substantiated. So what was the study protocol for this particular one? It was a single placement study, which means there was just one product being investigated. The study ran for two weeks uh, because it's a face mask. We wanted them to test it a few times and people to use it every day. It was an all skin type study. We wanted to make sure that we had a, a reflection of all skin types on the study. A nice large age group, 25 to 70. Um, the age group should always reflect your consumers that you're targeting. And in this case, they had a really large um, consumer base they were looking to target. They had to have blemishes and skin redness. As mentioned, they wanted to make sure it improves skin infections and redness. Um, so obviously our consumers have to have those present. Otherwise, how else are they going to analyze um, how the product performs? And it needs to be national if the marketing data is to be a reliable. Um, what this means is we basically don't like to target um, a particular sort of city or something. Um, if you're looking to sell in a certain country, you want to allow people from that whole country to take part in the study so it's reliable um, and this is where it's really important to use a testing house that has a large pool of volunteers uh, because if the people have sort of 10,000 volunteers on their system they're probably all going to be based in the same kind of area um, and so it's not going to be that reliable whereas we have 600,000 volunteers on our system so we can select uh, people from yeah all around the place um, and make sure that your your data is really um, unbiased basically towards location. So we ran the study, um, obviously for those two weeks. And at the end, we got a report about the product was assessed. Now our reports are in real time. So as soon as those volunteers answer that questionnaire, they got the responses in. This was generated straight away through uh, for us through our statistical analysis. We get a breakdown of every country of every question individually, individually. Um, but we also get this summary report, which I think is really really helpful for claims. Um, so to talk you through it a little bit, it's quite self-explanatory. But we have the uh, questions or the claims on one end. We then have the number of people that said they were satisfied, the number of people not satisfied, the percentage of people satisfied, and the percentage of people not satisfied. Um, so as you can see, we've got a really nice big volunteer basis here. We know that this is reliable evidence because if we repeated the test again, if we've got 200 people on there that agree, uh, the chances are that the, the people will always agree with these claims. So this is really um, important, significant evidence that we have. So we've got some really fantastic claims here. We can say that 92% agree that the skin felt soft. 93% agree that the skin appears smoother. 85% agree that the appearance of infections has improved. And 85% agree the appearance of blemishes have improved. So some really good claims, as we mentioned, just kind of picked out a few there, um, just so you can see how they kind of translate. Um, and that's how you could quote that evidence. So yeah, some good evidence there. So what are the penalties um, about misleading claims in the UAE? So this is just some examples of a quick Google search of the news articles that come out. Um, so this was actually all around the same time, around 2016 to 2018. Um, you can kind of see the story that ABG kind of came in and had a huge overhaul of people that were you know, being naughty, basically with their adverts and putting out misleading adverts um, and put out all these fines. So there's a fine for violating the advertising rules. So if you advertise any of the, um, of the code of conduct for the ABG, you can get a 5,000 uh, 
Durham, fine. Um, and then a same of um, in the, uh, sorry, if you post false to ads in particular, so again, that's any claims that aren't substantiated as a false advert, you've got a huge fine there of um, 200,000 AED as well. So be very cautious um, and don't put any misleading ads out there because as I said, the fines are very hefty in the UAE um, and the AVG are incredibly proactive, um, certainly compared to other countries. They are also very strict on having the evidence there. Um, you don't have a lot of time. If the ABG asks for your evidence, you do not have a lot of time before you have to produce it. So if you can't kind of backtrack and say, oh, okay, no, I've got the evidence here and quickly call us up and get us to run a quick consumer study, um, you're going to find that very difficult to get in time before they'll just find you. Uh, so be very cautious. So um, just some further advice for consumer studies in particular. Um, so these are kind of some FAQs, things that I get asked a lot by um, clients uh, just before doing a consumer study. So I thought this might be quite handy. So we always suggest a panel size starting at 100 responses. It is incredibly dependent on your product and your claims. Um, so that's my usual answer. So it's always a really hard thing to pinpoint down. But 100 responses is a really good thing to kind of keep in mind. Um, some people come up and ask, you know, can I run it with 30? You can run it with 30 people, but the evidence isn't going to be reliable um, and you won't be able to really use it. Um, there's a thing called a p-value. It's a very boring statistical analysis talk, but this is really important. Um, you have a p-value associated with any claim, uh, with any statistic um, that we have. And if that p-value is too high, uh, it's not reliable evidence. And the only way you can do bring it down is by having more people on the study. So that's kind of the overall thing. Um, and I know that with the new cosmetic regulations in China, they are looking at the p-value for your statistics. So you need to make sure you have it. I know it's the UAE in particular, but I think it's a really important thing to keep in mind. Um, but obviously, if you have things like all skin tones and, and types, um, you, a lot of people want to be really inclusive with their consumer research to make sure their marketing is really inclusive. And that is fantastic. But if you're going to have a representation of all ethnicities on your panel, um, the smaller the, the kind of panel size is, you're not going to have any significance there. So make sure that it really reflects what you want to break down. The more you're breaking down your results, essentially, the more respondents will need overall. Um, you need to inform your product liability insurance provider that you're doing in the consumer studies and we also have full product liability insurance so that's really important for you to know. Uh, your samples must have been safety tested or at least safety tested to the point they can be released on the market um, from us to test it so obviously there are some products that don't need safety testing at all um, but it's up to you you'll know what kind of safety testing you need uh, if it's safe to release on the market it's safe to send to our consumers. Uh, samples should be debranded. Studies should be conducted blind because we don't want to have any bias towards the brand. It's as simple as that. Um, and we can always debrand samples for you if you can't get blank packaging. And your questionnaire design must support your claims. Uh, it's quite simple and straightforward, but we do provide questionnaire design services because it's something, if your questionnaire design is poor, your claims will not be substantiated. And we can really help you on anything, <laughs> um, anything to do with that kind of thing. Study design, questionnaire design, that's what we're specialists at and that's what we're here for. So just to kind of sell us a little bit before I go to a QA, and a uh, we're an award-winning research agency. So we've won awards for international business and family business of the year. Um, we are fully compliant with the GDPR. We have to be. We are an EU company or after the time being, while well, the UK is still kind of in the limbo that we're in now. Um, but we have an ISO 27001 to, um, to prove that as well. Um, so you can see how committed we are to being audited on our GDPR capabilities. We have our own data protection officer in-house. It's incredibly important for a company like ours because we do hold data of over 600,000 volunteers on our system. And we also hold your data, sensitive data to do with inky lists and everything like that. It's really important um, that everyone is protected. Uh, we also have an ISO 9001, uh, which is our quality assurance ISO, so you can make sure that we're doing everything uh, kind of in a quality way. Uh, we've got undesirable event reporting, as I mentioned earlier, it's a great way of getting um, undesirable event data, and that's all made in accordance with the Cosmetic Vigilance Act. 
Uh, as I mentioned, we've got product liability insurance in every country that we operate, including the UAE. Uh, we're a partner to the MRS, the Market Research Society, so we are trained by them and we also make sure, basically their conduct, uh, code of conduct makes sure that everything we're doing is completely ethical, we don't advertise to our consumers, we don't reward them unless there is uh, no products involved in the test, uh, and make sure that your evidence is reliable as possible because there's no bias. Uh, we can provide regulatory advice at any point. That's what I'm here for. If you've got any regulatory questions, I will certainly help. And if I can't, I have a rich network of regula regulatory advisors as well, who I can point you in the direction of. Um, and you always get a designated study manager. So you have one point of contact, or contact um, who will be your only point of contact throughout your study management. So you don't have to kind of get passed around a team. Uh, you have a specialist in what you want, what your research objectives are. So. Now go to a question and answer. I think I've talked far, far too much already. <laughs> um, probably bored you all, but hopefully not. Um, so I can see there's a question coming already. Um, so can I claim antibacterial on a cosmetic product? Yes, you can, um, but it depends on the country and the regulations. So obviously every country is a little bit different. Um, I wouldn't be 100% sure in the UAE. I think that's something I'd have to check on in particular. Um, but I know over here that hand gels are counted as cosmetics. Um, so actually that antibacterial is fine. You just need to make sure there is an antibacterial, um, you've got a claim substantiation basically. Um, so it's something I would look at in particular. Again, it depends on the overall product. For every country um, regulations, this is really important to kind of consider, is that um, it really depends on what your presentation of the product is overall. So if it was something very medical um, and you had an antibacterial claim, as well as other claims and other presentations of the product that made it look med medical, it wouldn't be a cosmetic. Um, it, it's, it's really about the overall presentation of the product as well. And, and that's the same in any country. Um, but yeah, so you, you can do antibacterial, but it really depends on the specifics as well <laughs> if you know what i mean sorry that's not a very specific answer for you um but yeah i'll leave that open now guys if you've got any questions please feel free to type them through i will also um send out my contact information at the end of the webinar so if you do have any questions but not right now <laughs> um you can feel free to email them to me and i will do my best to answer them on email So I can't see any questions coming through and I don't want to hold everyone up too much, um, let you get on with your day a bit. So I'll leave that for now. Um, but just to finish up, um, oh, this always happens. There's always a question as soon as I skip it. So I'm sorry if this is already covered as I came in a bit late into the seminar, but how can I get a consumer responses on the packaging and design if it's been debranded? Fantastic question. Um, so this is something I get asked quite a lot because as I said, for claim substantiation, we really wanna make sure that the samples are debranded to remove a bias. You don't have to do testing just for claim substantiation, by the way, you can test anyway. Um, and for some countries, uh, you're allowed to have branded packaging. But our recommendation around this, um, to make sure that we can satisfy all regulations, is what I would usually do is do a consumer study with the debranded packaging. So the consumers would receive the debranded packaging with no information about the brand whatsoever, test it for say two weeks, and then answer a questionnaire about it. Once they've answered the questionnaire about the product and the claims and all the assessment of the efficacy, we would then go to a new section of the questionnaire, which would be about the product branding itself. So we can have pictures of the brand, we can release what the brand name is. Uh, we work with a really uh, prestigious hair care brand in the UK, um, and they always like to have feedback on their price point. So what they'll do is they'll do the study debranded, get those claims validated, and then they'll say, right, this, this brand is blah, blah, blah. Would you purchase this product um, now knowing this at blah, blah, blah. Um, and they actually ask the question before knowing the brand and after it as well, which is fantastic for their feedback. Um, and they ask the question before knowing the price, things like that as well. They say, would you purchase this product? And now would you purchase it at this price? Um, but yeah, you can then start putting things like pictures on there, video. Um, we've done that quite often where we show a video of the product. You know, we might show sort of pictures of the product on a shelf in a supermarket and say, you know, would you buy it if it was here or if it was here? Where, where does it stand out for you? Um, the world's your limit, but the only, the basically, it's a very simple way around it. You get the consumer testing done. You get all of that evaluation in. 
And then you ask about the brand once you have that. And it's really clear on the report as well, when you're looking at those advertising agents, that nothing's been revealed about the brand until after. There's a picture of your product, how the consumers have received it on your report, which is obviously in black packaging. Um, and it's just really clear. So it, it's, it's a very easy way around it. Again, if you're at a point where you don't want to um, do your claim substantiation, but you do want to have feedback on your branding, you can just send out branded samples um, and get them to test it as well. Um, some people I know do, do branded samples for consumer testing for claim validation. It's just never my recommendation because there's always a chance it can be under scrutiny. Um, and yeah, you want to be safe. You want to make sure that evidence can be used. Otherwise, it's a whole retest and it's a very expensive process to do it several times. Cool. Sorry, I talked a lot then. <laughs> I hope that's been, uh, that's answered your question though. Um, I'll continue finishing the presentation, but if there's any more questions come in, feel free to type them um, and uh, we'll, we'll do that as I finish as well. Um, but just to finish up, so the SCS training and events, there's the SCS diploma course. I was talking to someone yesterday who's just started this and said it's fantastic. It's a course in the essentials of cosmetic science. Um, and it's a, a distance learning, so you can do it anywhere in the world. If you work full time, you can do it in your, in your spare time. If, um, if you live kind of the other side of the world, you can still do it. So if that's what you're interested in, there is a link to it there. And there's also going to be the IFSCC Congress in London in September 2022. So hopefully we'll, we'll go ahead and we won't have this um, horrible global pandemic going on, but to meet in person. Um, and that you can register your interest at um, that website as well there. So thank you very much for listening today. Um, I know I talk a lot, I know it's a lot of information, but I hope it's been really, really helpful. Um, as mentioned, I'm going to send out the recording now with all of my contact information. So if you have any questions, please feel free to send them over to me. Have a fantastic Friday and a fantastic weekend. Um, and thank you very much. <laughs>